Hello, you'll be pleased to know that having spent the last four weeks or so uh, working your way through Pliny the Younger's Regulus, there are actually two texts to read um, in year 10, or at least to start in year 10. Uh, we often finish them in year 11. So you've got the Pliny text, Pliny the Younger's Regulus, uh, but you also have a slightly longer text by a man called Tacitus. Uh, Tacitus is a historian. Uh, he's an influential Roman. He was a senator, so he was a politician as well. But he's most famous among classicists as being a historian. Uh, he has two what are known as major works, uh, Tacitus's Histories, uh, which is uh, an account of the year 69 AD, which some of you will know is the year of the four emperors. It was meant to go on further than that, but that's all really we have, have left of it. Um, and his other major work, is known as Tacitus's Annals, um, and then the name may have given a hint to some of you that uh, it's a year-by-year -year history of the Roman state. So that's our second author. So it's, an, it's a piece of history this time rather than a letter. Um, the selection that we're going to look at has been entitled Germanicus and Piso, or Germanicus et Piso. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about who those people are in just a moment. Um, if you want to know a little bit more about Tacitus, and I hope you do, uh, the very f the very opening of the new booklet that I've sent you is um, a, a, a very brief introduction to who Tacitus is, or was rather. There's lots of information online about him as well, so feel free to look it up. Um, but yeah, there's an introduction there for you if you want to know a little bit about him. Um, he's got some interesting aspects to his life. His father-in-law was the governor of Britain. He himself was born in Gaul. He wasn't born in Rome. So yeah, he's an interesting chap. But from our, for our purposes, he's a historian who wrote an account of the Julio-Claudian dynasty. So that's the dynasty which starts with the first emperor, Augustus, um, and... Uh, and then moves into Tiberius, the second emperor, which is the, the author that we're interested in now. Uh, Tacitus himself, as I, uh, I may have already mentioned, starts with the death of Augustus, basically. So he starts with the succession to Rome's second emperor. Anyway, so he's writing a history about the Julio-Claudian dynasty. So our section is uh, about Germanicus and Piso. So who are Germanicus and Piso? They're not people that you're likely to have heard of. Uh, there's Germanicus. Uh, the first thing to notice is his face is on a coin, so he must have been influential. Uh, Germanicus was actually the grandson of the first emperor Augustus's sister, a woman called Octavia. So he's the first emperor's grand nephew. Uh, and he was married to a woman called Agrippina, who is actually the granddaughter of the emperor Augustus. So they're an influential couple. They are they are fairly integral to the Roman imperial imperial household. Okay, so that's the first thing to know about them. The interesting thing about them, though, is really what happens before the story that we're about to tell. In in many ways, you know, there's a catalyst of events which kicks off before the story you're about to read, which really results in the story that we're going to tell through this passage here. So. You may know uh, that uh, Rome's second emperor was this man called Tiberius here. Um, he wasn't the first emperor Augustus's son. Uh, he was the son of the emperor Augustus's wife. So he's a stepson of the emperor. Um, and for a variety of different reasons, uh, the emperor Augustus decided that when he died, which he did in 14 AD, he would leave the empire to Tiberius. It sounds very easy. It's not quite as simple as that, but but that's the basic thrust of it, that Tiberius was going to be the Emperor Augustus's heir and that he would take on control of the Roman state when the first Emperor Augustus died. Augustus, though, was a canny man. I think that's a good word for it. Um, and I don't think he was particularly fond of Tiberius. Uh, there are differing accounts of this, but uh, it seems like he was not particularly thrilled at the idea. Um, and he decided that rather than uh, just leave the empire secure, knowing that it would pass to Tiberius, he 
was a, a bit of a belt and braces man and he decided he wanted an insurance policy uh, and that if he were going to adopt Tiberius to take on the emperor after, after he died, then Tiberius must also adopt Germanicus. And in doing so, Augustus hoped that he had secured the, uh, the empire, not just for his, uh, the generation after him, but for the generation after that as well. So he's got fairly long-term goals. As you can imagine, if you're the second emperor, Tiberius, um, you may not have been very happy with that. I don't imagine that Tiberius was a very happy man anyway. Uh, not very many people seem to have liked him very much. Um, and he, he was not keen on having his choices made for him before he even became, became emperor. So there's a kind of rivalry between him and Germanicus. Germanicus is younger, um, he's more popular, uh, he's, they're both generals, but Germanicus has a kind of military glory about him, which maybe Tiberius doesn't have in quite the same way, or maybe that's just a reflection of the fact that people didn't like Tiberius very much. But whatever the reasons, Tiberius doesn't like Germanicus. He sees him as a threat. So he decides, before our story starts, that he will send him down to the sort of farthest corners of the Roman Empire. So here's a map of the Roman the Roman world. Actually, this map is not accurate for the time that we're looking at because Britain was not included in it at that point. But otherwise, it's a reasonable representation of what the Roman state looked like. Um, and Tiberius decides that he's going to get Germanicus out of the way. And he sends him off from Rome all the way down to Syria and the Middle East down here. He sends him off as a, as a general. Not enough just to get rid of him, though. Germanicus, uh, sorry, Tiberius decides that he will send with Germanicus, or sort of alongside Germanicus, uh, another man called Piso, who was, again, a fairly influential politician. Uh, he was a consul, um, and he decides that he's going to send him to be the governor of Syria. So we've got both Germanicus and Piso, thus the title of the story, heading off down to this region down here. One to command a military campaign and the other to govern the province which was normal for politicians to do what seems to have happened though and we don't we don't have any real proof of this but what seems to have happened is that Tiberius sent Piso along with Germanicus in order to cause him trouble basically uh, make Germanicus look bad um, and far worse than that I'm not going to spoil the story but uh, some things are the events which take place out there are not particularly pleasant here. Yeah. But the point of it is that it seems as if Tiberius had set Germanicus up to fail uh, and worse uh, in order just to get him out of the way. So the story starts in AD 18. It's divided into a number of little chunks. Each chunk has a sort of title page like this. So do read those as well, just to give yourself uh, a bit of the background. But I'm going to leap straight in with the text. So hopefully we will uh, be able to get through this in not too much time. Let's just get that the appropriate size so that we can see it nice and clearly. Maybe that can go a tiny bit bigger. There we go. Okay, so our first section, uh, Piso has been sent to Syria and this is him as he arrives. And Tacitus tells us, at Gnaeus Piso, Quo Calerius concilia incipiret, postquam suriam ac legiones attigit, largitione et ambitu in fimos militum uabat. So the starting point, at, uh, actually means but. Uh, I'm not sure that you'll have seen this before. You're more commonly used to said, I would have thought. So, but, CN stands for Gnaeus, annoyingly, but there we go. So, but, Gnaeus Piso, so this is our chat Piso. And you get this little subordinate clause. Quo calerius concilia in Cyparet. Quo, um, at certain points, can function like ut. Or any, it's a bit of qui qui quad, so any bit of qui qui quad can function like, like ut, as long as it's got a subjunctive with it. And here, here there is a subjunctive, in Cyparet. So quo in Cyparet. Because quo is ablative, though, uh, it's got the sort of function of by which. So... Gnaeus Piso, by which 
in Kipperet, he could begin. And then the object of that is Concilia here, his plans, Hilarious, more quickly. That's not great in terms of its fluidity in English, but Gnaeus Piso, by which he might begin his plans more quickly. If you substitute quo for ut, though, and say, but Gnaeus Piso, so that he could begin his plans more quickly, suddenly that feels a lot more comfortable. And that's the function that the quo has here. Uh, I've written a little note on it underneath as well. Uh, here, quo is used to show purpose. Um, but so that is much, much easier. Anything in bold has a note on it underneath as well. Anyway, so, but Gnaeus Piso, so that he could begin his plans, i.e. his plans to disrupt uh, Germanicus's actions, so that he could begin his plans more quickly. Postquam suriam ac legiones attigit. After postquam, the verb attigit literally means to sort of touch at, but here I'm going to translate it as to reach. So after he reached we're dealing with places after he reached Suriam, Syria, Ac Legiones, and the legions. And we're looking for an action here. Largitione et ambitu infimos militum uabat. And there's your action at the end there. Uabat. Um, you will have come across the verb ad uo, uh, which basically means the same thing. So he was helping. Often you can use the imperfect, which is what you've got here, you are, but you can use the imperfect to show he began to do something. So that's a possibility here, and I think what I'm going to go with. So after he reached Syria and the legions, he began to help. You All that's contained in you are, but he began to help. The accusative here is the adjective infimos, uh, which kind of means the lowest, uh, not in terms of in terms of height but in terms of social standing so i've off, also offered in the vocabulary the meanest or the basest so he began to help the lowest militum is in the genitive of the soldiers and then at the end of the uh, the first line you've got both these ablatives he began to help the lowest of the soldiers largitione um which i think i would translate as a uh, generosity um you might have come across the english word largesse um which means the giving it giving away of gifts of money basically so he began to help the lowest of the soldiers largitione with generosity and then you've got et ambitu over here and ambitus in that it means bribery uh, it can mean ambition you know uh, in, the, in the same way the English, English word obviously comes from it, but uh, usually it's used in a negative sense. It means to bribe somebody in order to help you get your, get what you want. So he began to help the lowest of the soldiers with generosity and bribery. Well, why would he do that, you might ask yourself. Why, what, what interest has he got? He wants them to be loyal to him, basically. So he's giving them money uh, in order to, that they'll go, all oh, that piso, what a great guy. So, he's, uh, he's making an impression as soon as he arrives in Syria. Cum veteres centuriones, severos tribunos demoviset, locaque eorum clientibus suis attribuiset, decidiam in castris, licentiam in urbibus, lasciuientes per agros milites sinebat. So that's very long. Often, the easiest thing to do is to think about where the verbs are. So I'm just going to go as far as our first verb which is this demo wiset over here. So, cum clause, to start us off, cum, uh, and the demo wiset is uh, subjunctive as well, so definitely a when clause here. So, cum, when, veteres centuriones, severos tribunos, demo wiset. Um, veteres centuriones and severos tribunos uh, are both in the accusative, so you want to take your subject here with the T on the end of it as he, she, or it, so that means piso. So, when he... Demoiset had removed. You can see the verb moeo in there to move something, literally to sort of move down. So when he had removed, and the two objects are the veteres centuriones. Uh, veteres is where we get the English word veteran from. So when he had removed the veteran soldiers, severos tribunos. I'm sorry, not the veteran soldiers, the, vet the veteran 
centurions. The centurions are a kind of company commander in the Roman legion. Uh, you'd think they'd be in charge of 100 men, but normally it's more like 80. But it, they, they're they in charge of a, of a group of men, basically. So when he had removed the long-standing, the veteran centurions, Sewerus Tribunos, you're going to need to put an and the in here. It doesn't work without it. Yeah. And the, the, the harsh tribunes, again, tribunes are a rank, of soldier, their military tribunes in the army. So when he, when he had removed the long-standing centurions and the harsh tribunes, the strict tribunes may be better, locaque eorum clientibus suis attribuisset. So you're going to need the quet first, actually, and. So that's on the locker quet over here. And, and you're going to need another verb again. So I'd go straight on to the attribuiset. And had attribuiset. So uh, again, the English word is clearly to attribute something, but to assign, to hand over, to give something. And had assigned locker, this is your object in the neuter plural, the places, aorum, genitive plural of them. So and had assigned their places, clientibus suis, to his clients, pause there for a moment what does it mean by his clients it means people who have uh, a kind of relationship with him not necessarily a business one although that may come into it but roman society is based on a sort of hierarchy uh, where patrons have clients you know so everybody would have a patron and if you needed a favor you would go and you would go and see him uh, and say can you help me out and he probably would help you out might have to do something for him in exchange. So everybody's got a sort of more wealthy backer, basically. Anyway, these are Piso's clients. So when he had removed the uh, long-standing soldiers, uh, centurions, sorry, same mistake again, uh, and the strict tribunes, and had assigned their places, clientibus suis, to his clients. So he's basically getting people in positions who he can trust. De sidiam in castris, licentiam in urbibus, lasciuientes per agros milites sinebat. Our last verb is this sinebat down here, which is to allow. So he allowed. And then you've got a number of accusatives which are sat after that. So he allowed de sidiam in castris. Uh, de sidiam has sort of got a sense of sitting down, you know, so idleness, inactivity. So he allowed idleness in the camp. Castries looks as if it's plural, which technically it is, but you always translate it if it's singular. So he allowed idleness in the camp. He allowed licentiam in urbibus. Uh, again, English word license from licentiam. Uh, but in this case, sort of hooliganism, sort of freedom to do what you want. So he allowed idleness in the camp, hooliganism in the cities. So you could imagine that uh, Roman camps were set up near um, settlements and the soldiers would go and intermingle with the locals. You know, and what you don't want is a whole bunch of rowdy soldiers turning up in your city, but that's what Pisa is allowing these soldiers to do. So he allowed idleness in the camp, hooliganism in the cities, and then he allowed lasciuientes per agros milites. Lasciuientes is actually a participle and it's describing milites uh, and the verb lasciuio means to run riot so he allowed rampaging soldiers through the fields much more straightforward in english to say he allowed the soldiers to rampage through the fields so i hope you're getting an idea that piso is setting to work very quickly remember that he's gone to syria because germanicus is on the way over in that direction and uh, piso is setting out to make trouble for germanicus so he's uh, corrupting the local soldiers basically he's giving them favors and money and then he's removing anybody who has got any authority in the camp so these wetteres canturiones and these sewerus tribunos these uh, long-standing centurions and the strict sol uh, strict tribunes and then is letting the soldiers do what they want obviously they're going to be keen on that as an idea in the same way as i'm sure if we said we, you can come to school every day, but we won't let you. We, we won't make you do any work. I'm sure you'd be thrilled with that. But it's not in the long-term interests of the soldiers to be allowed to do whatever they want. Anyway, so that's the that's the environment which Piso has created. 
Then he brings, then Tacitus brings in Piso's wife, a woman called Plankina. So let's hear a little bit about her. Nec Plankina, uxor Pisonis, se gerebat, ut feminam decebat. I'm going to stop there. I know it's not the end of the sentence. Uh, this is um, not a very politically correct sentence uh, in the 21st century, uh, but we'll, we'll translate it anyway. Nec Plankina, and Plankina did not, or nor did Plankina. Nor did Plankina, uh, and then you get this little description of her immediately afterwards in the commas. Books or Pisonis, the wife of Piso. Nor did Plankina, the wife of Piso, say Gerebat. Gero is a word which is on the GCSE list, um, usually in the context of bellum Gero, which means to wage war. But you can put it with um, a pronoun referring to a person. So like may Gero means I behave myself or I conduct myself. So say Gary Bat is doing the same thing here. So Nordi Plankina, the wife of Piso, conduct herself. Technically, it's imperfect, but tricky in English. So I'm just going to translate it as perfect. Nordi Plankina, the wife of Piso, conduct herself. Ut feminam decebat. Ut with a subjunctive. You'll have met lots of times. Purpose, result, that sort of thing. Here you've just got um, an ordinary indicative verb, decebat. As... Decebat was befitting, as was suiting for. Um, I think last year when I translated this my year 11s, we opted for behoved, um, just because it's a great word, but that's what it means, to be fitting something. So, nor did Plankina, the wife of Piso, conduct herself, say Gerebat, ut Decebat, as was fitting feminam, for a woman, as befitted a woman. Well, what does that mean? And you, you will know, I'm sure, that in the Roman state, there, was, there were very particular roles for women. Um, and it was unusual for a woman to set out, step outside of those roles. So Plankina is going to do that. So she didn't behave as a woman should, as a woman ought. Said, exercitio equitum interarat. Said, but, again. Uh, interarat is from the verb inter sum, so which means to be present to be among, literally, inter erat, but she was present. Exercitio equitum. Uh, Exercitio, you might yeah, see the word exercise in that, you know, uh, which is really what it means, training or exercise. But she was present uh, at training. Equitum is a genitive plural. Uh, you can see it's obviously, obviously linked with horses in some ways, but equus is uh, a cavalryman. Uh, so equitum is of the cavalry, but she was pregnant. She was present, rather. She wasn't pregnant at this time, I'm afraid. But she was present at cavalry exercises, or literally exercises of the cavalry. Et in Agrippinam, in Germanicum, contumelias iaciebat. And, so bad enough that she turned up at the cavalry exercises. And iaciebat. So iacio means to throw something. Okay. Uh, and, and again, that's a word which is on your GCSE list, so you, you should be aware of that one. And was throwing. And then contumelias over here is the object of that. And was throwing insults or abuse. We talk about hurling insults or abuse in English, so that might be a good way of translating it. So she was present at the cavalry exercises and she was hurling insults. Again, that Imperfect is difficult in English. Um, possibly something like wood is quite nice there to show the continuity of it. So she was present at the uh, cavalry exercises and would hurl insults. And she would hurl them in Agrippina. At Agrippina. In, I know, normally means in or into. But when it's used with a person, um, something like at or against is a, a nice way of translating it. So she would hurl insults at Agrippina. Again, you're going to, need an, going to need an and here. And in Germanicum against Germanicus. So Germanicus himself, the politician, she's uh, hurling abuse at him. Uh, and Agrippina, as I'm sure we must have already mentioned earlier in the video, is his wife. So she's being downright rude. It's not right for a Roman woman to go to cavalry exercise. It's not a woman's place. But... Um, even worse, she's being vicious and unpleasant when she is there.
of this Tasta says, nota haec Germanico, sed priwerti ad Armenios instantior cura fuit. Okay, so haec really is the sort of focal point here. Uh, this is hic, haec, hoc. It's new to plural. So these things, and you're going to need to put a verb to be in there. So these things were nota. Uh, nota means sort of known. Uh, in the sense of being aware of them. Okay, so these things were known, and then Germanico is in the dative, to Germanicus. So you might want to turn that around and say, Germanicus knew about these things, but literally these things were known to Germanicus. Said priwerti ad armenios instantior cura fuit. Okay, so said right back at the very beginning, but the subject is actually the cura down here. Um, I'm going to take that back, actually. That's not quite what I mean. Let's start with the priority over, over, over here. Uh, this is an infinitive of a, depo of a deponent verb. And you can use an infinitive to stand in for a noun. That sounds a very complicated thing, but we do it in English. Sentences uh, like, I don't know, I like to dance, for instance. Uh, to dance is the object of the verb. I like to do it. I like doing it. Okay. So let's start actually over here with the priority. Said priority, and priority means to turn to something, to attend to something. So, but to attend to, and then you've got an ad afterwards with the Armenios, but you don't really need it. You've already sort of said it. But to attend to the Armenians, again, there's a little note on the Armenians um, underneath somewhere. Oh, no, there isn't actually. I must have taken it out. Apologize. I apologize for that. Uh, Armenia is a region uh, in the Middle East um, and they are sort of on, on Rome's borders and Rome has generally lots of issues uh, with the Armenians. Um, so dealing with them first of all. But dealing with the Armenians and then take the verb fuit was a cura, a care, a concern. So, but to deal with the Armenians was a care, was a concern, and it was an instantior cura. Uh, again, you can see that that's comparative. So, uh, a more, and then instans means pressing. So, a more pressing concern. Anyway, so let's run that back from the beginning. So, nota haec Germanico. These things were known to Germanicus. Said priority but attending to ad Armenios, to the Armenians, instantior cura fuit, was a more pressing concern. Now that we've actually got to the end of that, that feels like there was an awful lot there in one go. So really do take your time over it um, and let me know if you have any queries. Uh, if everything is okay, that's great. But if there is anything, do shout, do send me an email or a message somewhere and ask me about things. I'm more than happy to receive them. Okay, good luck. Thanks very much.